book of Psalms. This is sermon number, I believe, 33 in the book of Psalms for us. We're on Psalms 27. Psalms 27. We're actually going to cover the whole psalm tonight, as amazing as that is. I was tempted to break it into two, but I felt like it really had a nice... I didn't want to break up the beautiful flow of it. Um, just to kind of catch everybody up, Psalms 25 to 28 were all written, people are believed, most theologians believe were all written at the same time. Whatever event was going on in David's life, which we don't know what the exact event that was going on in David's life when he wrote Psalms 25 to 28. My personal opinion, and that's all it is, it's conjecture. I have some biblical basis for my opinion, but I can't prove it. Nobody says, and by the way, because the Bible doesn't tell us, it kind of means we don't necessarily need to know. But because I love just the Word of God and studying it and going deeper than I probably should sometimes, I think that this was when David's son Absalom was trying to take the kingdom away from him. And so I believe this would have been when he would have been running and hiding. And when he would have wrote Psalms 25 through 28, we've covered Psalms 25, or 25 and 26 in the weeks uh, prior. So now we're going to get Psalms 27 tonight. Psalms 27 tonight. If you would please stand in honor of God's Word with me. And uh, we'll read... The whole psalm, all 14 verses. Beautiful psalm by David. It starts by saying, the Lord is my light and my salvation. By the way, that's capital L-O-R-D. That's Jehovah, Jesus in the Old Testament. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. And whom shall I be afraid? I love that. If God's on your side. What do you got to worry about? Uh, when the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Now that's, that's big talk. A host is a lot of people. Um, if I got to fight one guy, I might take my chances. I'll be all right. If I got to fight like 10, 15, 20 guys, I'm going to be nervous personally, but uh, I guess I don't trust the Lord enough. Though, though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the place of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock, make me stable. It's been on my mind because of Galatians lately, but there it is. There it is again. Galatians, stability, there it is, stable. Verse 6, And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices, notice this, of joy. Everybody gives, everybody wants to do for the Lord. Oh yeah, we, we got to go to church. We got to give to the Lord. We got to sing praise to the Lord. He says, man, when I sacrifice to the Lord because of what he's done for me, I'm going to do it out of joy. It's exciting to give to the Lord. It's exciting to sacrifice to the Lord. I will sing, yea, will, yea I will sing praises unto the Lord. And then this would be, it, it kind of breaks from verses 1 to 6 to then 7 and 14. This would be his prayer. So he made a statement about what the Lord is. He made a statement about what he would like from the Lord. And now he is praying and asking the Lord something. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. That's good. What the Lord says to do, do it. If God says this is how you commune with me, do it that way. Verse 9. Hide not thy face from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not. Neither forsake me, O Lord God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. By the way, he wasn't implying that they did, but he's saying even when my parents can't, you're still there. By the way, there is a point when even humans can't help you, no matter how much they love you. And there's probably no humans in the world that love you as much as your own parents, aside from maybe your spouse. And he's saying, even when my parents can't help me, you can help me. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me. 
and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Now, this would be his encouragement to anybody that would be listening. Now, they would have obviously turned this into a psalm. This was a Hebrew psalm that they would have sang. So this kind of would have been an encouragement right there at the end. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you bless this time in your word. Help me to focus in on your word, to give. Uh, Lord, I, you, as you know, when I work on a Wednesday night message, I usually have a Sunday's messages in my brain as well. So Lord, help me to be clear of thought. Lord, give me the words to say. Uh, Lord, help me to apply this. Help us all to apply it to our lives. Lord, to see the relevance of your word, because your word is still powerful today in 2022. And the uh, Lord be with the people here. If there's any that don't know you as a personal savior, I ask that today would uh, at least plant or water the seed. Uh, but it'd even be great to see you bring an increase in somebody getting saved even tonight. And Lord, help us in this time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. you may be seated. Thank you for standing. Titled the message tonight, A Safe Place. A Safe Place. Having little kids is great. But there are some things that frustrate you about having little kids. One of the things that frustrates me, and I don't want to sound like a bad dad, so just bear with me while I talk about this. Don't just immediately think, oh, he's a terrible father. He just hates his kids. It's not it at all. One of the things that frustrates me about my kids is I and Holly are their safe place. Now, during the day, this is fine. You're scared, daddy's here. You're hurt, daddy's, well, daddy's sometimes here. Use them, say, tough it out, shake it off, walk it out, you'll be fine. But sometimes daddy's here. Uh, and, and I don't mind being their safe place. I don't mind being where they run to. I don't mind being their shelter and their comfort during the day. At nighttime, I don't like it as much. <laughs> now, let me make it clear. My kids sleep literally right across the hall from us. Our door's not closed. Their door's not closed. The two kids are sleeping. Braxton's still in a crib in our room, but uh, Izzy and Braxton are just across the hall. I mean, literally as close to being in the room with us aside from just being in the room with us. I mean, it is, you know, like five feet. It's, it's, they're close. And yet still, for some reason, in the middle of the night, if they have a nightmare, if they have a bad dream, they just don't feel good, guess where they come? To the safe place, to mom and dad's room. And uh, the reason I don't like it is because I like sleep. <laughs> and uh, it really changed once Holly uh, had Brody because now I'm the caretaker of the older two. So now she's dealing with him, so I gotta deal with them. And I like my sleep, so it frustrates me. But it frustrates me because I'm human, if I'm being honest. It frustrates me because, well, I'm selfish. I like sleep. I'm selfish. I want to be left alone. I'm, I'm greedy sometimes as a parent. Don't, before you think bad on me, we all are. I'm just making the same. That's why it frustrates me. But unlike an earthly father like myself, God never sleeps and always desires we come to him when we are hurt or scared. And David does just that in, in our passage. He finds his safe place in the Lord. Now, don't take that safe place in a bad way. I know now, you know, with, with our woke culture, safe places, you know, kids, need, everybody need, I, I, this, I don't believe in any of that, but a true safe place, somewhere you go when you're uh, in trouble, scared, or need comfort. Verse 4 through 6 states that God is that for David. Now, give me some grace. We're actually going to cover verses 4 through 6, then we'll come back to verses 1 through 3. So look at verses 4 through 6 with me. Uh, he gives some uh, he gives some great insight here. You look back at verse 4. He says, One thing have I desired of the Lord. One thing. Now, if I asked you tonight, what is one thing that you, if you could have one thing, uh, maybe it would help our, for illustration purposes. This isn't a real, but imagine a genie in a bottle for some of you, uh, a one wish granted. If you could ask just one thing of the Lord, anything you like, what would that one be? one thing be? Do you have that one thing? Is there, has there been a time where you've thought, this is just the one thing I'd ask if I ever got a chance or if God get, would bless me with anything. And I'd ask you, would it even be spiritual? How often we think so physically, don't we? And Sunday morning's message is going to talk about that, but it is hard sometimes to get out of the physical to think on the spiritual. So I'd, I'd ask you, what is the one thing or do you have that one thing? David desired one thing but also was willing to seek it. He says, that will I seek after. Seek after means search out. He wasn't only, he, he said, Lord, I know what I want. If I had just one thing I can get from you and I'm willing to work for it. A lot of people have requests from the Lord, but they're not willing to put in the time and effort that it actually takes. Now, 
could God miraculously do it? Yes, but there does take, so usually, anything you want of the Lord kind of takes, in part, something from you. One of, my, one of my biggest prayer requests is that my kids get saved young. And don't doubt it later either. <laughs> Obviously, they're going to doubt it at times, but I mean, get saved for sure. No, I want to get saved young. Well, you know that there's some of that falls on me. I've got to be talking about the gospel to them. I have to be spiritually minded with them. We have to be reading our Bible. We have to do our family devotions. We have to focus on the fact that they are lost and they are. And, and you say, well, man, they're only four and three. I know. And my four-year-old's already asking me what happens after you die. And she's already asking me questions like that because, well, kids are pretty smart, which scares me. You have to say, he said, I, I, I know what I want and I'm willing to seek after it. I'm willing to work for it. I'm willing to search it out. For David, that one thing was this, in verse 4, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. What a statement. By the way, my personal opinion is he wrote this when he was far away from the house of the Lord. As he is on the run and Absalom's reigning in his own kingdom and he's out having to hide away, I think he really desired to get back to the house of the Lord. To get back to the presence of God. Very much as a child runs into their parents' room because it is safe. He's saying, man, through all this turmoil, through all this trouble, I just want to be in the presence of God. That is my one request. If I could ask anything, that is it. Many Christians today think being in the house of the Lord one day a week is just too much. And yet here David said, every day. I wish I could just be there every day. You say, well, God, he's omniscient, pastor. And in case you didn't know, that means he's everywhere. I can be with God everywhere. I know, but there's something special about the house of God. Amen. There is. If, if, if we learned anything from COVID, I heard, hope you learned that. That there is something special about the house of God. Well, what makes the house of the Lord special, Pastor? Glad you asked. David enumerated it for us in the rest of uh, verses uh, 4 through 6. He said, To behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the times of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. All of that takes place in the context of in the house of God. He says, what I really want is to be in the house of God. Because in the house of God, here's what happens. So let's break that down just quickly. I'm going to try to be fast. So... Listen fast and I'll talk fast. I talk fast anyway, so even if you're listening slow, then you can finish your sermon about 8 o'clock. The rest of us will be done out here before then. But let's break that down. In the house of the Lord, you witness the beauty of God. You witness the beauty of God. I'll tell you, at church is where you hear preaching. I love listening to preaching. I listen to a lot of preaching, uh, downloaded sermons every day probably. I, I, I guarantee there's not a day that goes by that I don't listen to a, a, some portion of a downloaded sermon. And yet, man, it's not the same. It's, I, it's, it's why I enjoy going and visiting other churches on Sunday afternoons. It's why I enjoy going to camp on Thursday nights or Tuesday nights or whatever night we make it up to camp. It's why I enjoy men's retreats and, and any kind of preaching conferences because there's something special about getting in the house of the Lord and hearing the word of God preach. And it's beautiful. You say, why is it beautiful? I don't know. How about the God of all creation wrote a book for all mankind, but specifically to speak to your heart. And when God speaks to my heart, it's a beautiful thing because I don't deserve him speaking to me. Now, you may feel like you deserve him speaking to you, but I know who I am. And I don't know why he called me. And I don't know why he chose me. And every time he uses the word of God and smokes my heart, I'm like, man, that's, that's amazing. That's wonderful. That, that's, it's really quite beautiful. It's where you learn about God's grace and his mercy. In churches where you see people who are all different unite in him. I love that about church. I love that when I visit just about any independent Baptist church, I can fit right in. The moment I walk in, it's not even like I'm strange. I mean, I am strange. That's the thing. Anywhere else, I walk into any other setting and I'm strange. But man, when I walk into an independent Baptist church, even if, of, of, of like faith and practice, I walk in and I fit right in. And then you can see people of all different backgrounds and all different races and all different colors. And, cre and it's like they come together and when they get together, it's like we're all one. That doesn't happen anywhere else. Like nowhere else except in the house of God. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, number two, the house of God is a hiding place in times of trouble. One thing I love about coming to church, at least for me, if it's not the case for you, uh, it should be, is that, man, it seems like problems just have to stay outside when I get to come in. Now, granted, a lot of my problems happen because I pass with the church and, and I deal with those. But it is nice that, man, when I walk in here, you know what? Financial issues, I don't have to worry about that. Marital issues, 
I don't have those, but I'm sure for those that do, you don't have to worry about those. <laughs> That's a joke. I, I, I hate when people say, oh, my wife and I never argue. And I'm like, so do you not live together? <laughs> do you never talk? <laughs> That's worse than the people that say, yeah, we have our arguments, but we get through it. We, you know, my wife and I don't argue. We, uh, we have discussions, spirited discussions. <laughs> But I, I love the fact that when I come to church, it's like all that is, is secondary to what is foremost in my mind, which is praising God, worshiping God, and hearing from God. That's what really is on my mind when I come to church. It's a hiding place from trouble. The house of God is stable. We already talked about that. He says, on a, let's place my feet on a rock. One thing I love most uh, about church, and, and it's something that most of you can actually say is true more than I can because I'm only 29 years old. But I love that the music I've been singing since I was a kid, it really hasn't changed. Now, some would say, well, that's boring. No, no, it's stable. It's the music that's worked. It's the music of revivals. It's the music that they've sang that have done it. The, 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 the songs that we sing out of hymns, they're not just new fangled ones. And, and I, by the way, there, are good new, there is good new music out. Most of my specials are good new music. That's okay. I'm, I'm not arguing that. But I love the fact that we can still sing these same songs. And the songs that were true that my grandparents sang when they were my age are still true. Amen. I love the fact that the Bible's still the same. Amen. I can't imagine what it'd be like to go to a church that, and I never know what Bible the pastor's going to choose to use that day. I didn't like the way that Bible said it that way, so I'm going to use this one today. And, and today I'm going to be reading out of the NIV. And if you want to join in, or, you know, and that just seems unstable. Same music, same Bible. I try to keep the same style, even. You know, in a lot of ways, I try to be old fashioned in some of what I do. And not because I'm old fashioned, well, I guess I am old fashioned, but because it's the way that's worked. It's stable. The house of God is stable. It's a place of victory. I love how I said this. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Uh, one thing that's talked about at Silver State, and I reference Silver State a lot, but I love Silver State. I go there uh, all summer, and I try to get there as much as I can, unless Brother Carter's going to put me to work. <laughs> I love Silver State, but one thing that's talked about at Silver State is the victories won in that tabernacle. They talk about that a lot. Man, it's this tabernacle. There's been some victories won. It's been on this campground. It's been, and, and that's true of that tabernacle, but it's more true of this church. Victories aren't won at this church just eight weeks out of the summer. Victories are won in this church every week. Sometimes we get to see them. Sometimes we don't. I love to get to see people saved. Amen. I wish I saw it every week. I, 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 mean, I, I pray that we do. That's one of my prayer requests is that I, every Sunday I want to see somebody saved. I want to see somebody saved. I wish that were true. But we've seen people saved. We've seen lives change. We've seen marriages that were on the brink become healthy. We've seen people going through turmoil become healthy. We've seen people struggle with addictions become healthy. And it's, it's victories that have been won because man, is this place, it's a place of victory. The house of God is a place of victory. It's a place to give joyfully. David was excited to offer sacrifice to the Lord and knew it would be a joyful thing. I enjoy getting to give. Not just my money, but I enjoy giving my money because I, I love reading our, our missions letters. I'm so glad we're a church that reads every one of them. And I, you know, praise the Lord, I, my, my, my heart's intent, no matter how many missionaries we have, I'll read them all. We're going to read them all. Praise the Lord. We're going to read them all. I say, why? Because that gives me joy when I read stories of people getting saved. And when I read stories of people uh, making decisions and I read stories of people getting baptized, you say, well, we didn't read any like that tonight. Well, no, but we, 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 we read some victories of Miss Tabitha getting, getting good reports from the doctor. And we read victories of, 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 of our church plant, Pagosa Springs, having a good revival with Brother Russ Bishop, even though last minute, really some things kind of tried to throw that off the rails. And we, we heard of 22 going to camp and two surrendering to be in the ministry. And that's, that's, it may not be salvation, but that's awesome news. Amen. That's why I love to give. But I love to give my time and my energy too. I love that whatever I do here is not for just the sake of doing it. I was vacuuming today. I know that's hard to imagine, but I do. I like to vacuum actually. It's usually what I do when I'm, I, I, today, man, I've been battling with my Sunday afternoon sermon and you could ask Holly, I went home and I was just frustrated. I'm battling with this thing. And I had to just go and work some more. Uh, but man, I was just vacuuming. You know what? I, I, got, I get paid for vacuuming technically. because I'm. Gonna, I get it. I get it. Some of you are like, you got paid. You got your reward. But there's nothing I do for this church that's not going to be rewarded one day. 
But also, the same reason why David was willing to give joyfully is because of what God was doing for him. I don't mind vacuuming the floors because God's given me the health to vacuum the floors. He's given me the ability to vacuum the floors. He's given us the electricity to vacuum the floors. He's given us vacuums to vacuum the floors. When, we, uh, when I made the hay mess for VBS, I thought, man, how bad would it stink if, if, if all we had was brooms? Because that, that was the first line of defense. We, we took and swept all the, the hay up. All the big stuff got rid of that. But there was a whole lot more left. I thought, man, if we were trying to get all this by hand, this would... I'm so glad I get a vacuum. So I think it just... I know that's you say, vacuuming is such a silly example. But I'm glad I get to do it. And I'm glad God's given me the tools to do it with. It's exciting to give to the Lord. It's also a place to sing praises to God. Now, you can sing praises to God anywhere. We do it at our house. Do it in the car. I do it when I'm alone. That way nobody has to listen to me. But man, anybody that, that has been in the congregational service or in a service and, and the congregational singing is just moving, it's awesome. When people are involved, when people are singing out, when people are, are not just saying the words, but thinking about the words and praising the name of God, oh, it's powerful. It's wonderful in the house of God. Those are the things that make the house of the Lord great. But, but <laughs> those things on their own are not enough to drive people to God's house. Let me say that again. Those things on their own are not enough to drive people to God's house. If they were, then everybody that came to church one time would just keep coming. Because of the great things we've mentioned. That we could say every one of those things is true of even our church. And yet, people come, visit, never come back. People will wishy-washy in their attendance. If they... If, if they were, if those things were enough to drive people to church, everyone would come back. So what was it that caused David to desire to be in the house of the Lord for the rest of his life? Well, that's where the first three verses come into play. Now, I know we're taking a lot of time. Don't worry, we're speeding through the, the prayer at the end, so it's all right. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, oh, no, pastor, you just got three verses done. I know. David desired to be in the house of the Lord where sacrifice and praise happen because of what the Lord did for David in the past. Verses 1 through 3 are the past. You know why my children want to be in my room when they're scared, hurt, or need comfort? It's not because my room is special. Because if I were in a different room in my house, let's say I just picked the other room down the hall, guess where they'd come? You know why it's special to them? Because daily, maybe not me, <laughs> more my wife, daily, my wife is taking care of their needs. We've provided for them. We've fed them. We've clothed them. We've kissed owies and boo-boos. We've, we've loved on them and hugged them and, and, and tried our best to nurture them. And because of what we've done for them through their life, that's why our room is special. You get what I'm saying here? Let me say it again. Because of what we've done for our children all their life, that's what makes our room special. What David is saying here is, I want to be in the house of God, not just because of how great the house of God is. It is great. He enumerates that. Verses 4 through 6, he enumerates how great the house of God is and the special things that happen in the house of God. But what he's saying is, the reason I want to dwell in the house of God every day for the rest of my life is because what have God has done for me in the past. Well, what did you do for him in the past? Look at verses 1 through 3. We'll point them out real quick. David wanted to be in the house of the Lord for the rest of his life. Because, number one, the Lord was his light. The metaphor of light signifies the joy of life, the perfection of holiness, and the illumination of the way of truth. Light also dispels darkness, which represents evil, confusion, gloom, and despair. Jesus was David's light. He brought him joy, the joy of life, in despite of darkness and circumstances that weren't favorable. That's a good way to put it. They weren't favorable. They were terrible. They, if I were my wife get mad, they sucked is what, I, what, what came to mind. I tried to say it nicer than that, but it came out anyway. <laughs> you know why David loved being in the house of the Lord? Because God was his joy in life. I've noticed in my short life, that the people who have the most joy through hard times are typically people who love the Lord and are in his house pretty often. Like 
as much as they can be. That's typically the people who get through the hard times best. Not always, because some people are faithful to church, but aren't really faithful to God, and so they don't really have the joy of life. But what I've noticed in my short life is that it is true. That the people who can go through hard times and still retain their joy in the Lord are the people who love to be in the Lord's house and love their relationship with Him. But number two, the Lord was His salvation. Meaning the Lord brings victory and deliverance. Because God continually delivered David from bigger and stronger enemies, He determined, whom shall I fear? Or whom shall I be afraid? I, think of, I can't help but think of Goliath. When you think of bigger enemy, David, bigger enemy, Goliath. Granted, he faced bigger obstacles than Goliath because reality was Goliath was still just one man and he had to face some big problems later on in his life. Some armies even, some nations that wanted to destroy him. When, when, when David looked back at his past, he said, man, God delivered me from Goliath. I didn't need a sword. I didn't need a shield. I didn't need an AR. <laughs> Give me an AR, I'll take my chance against Goliath. <laughs> he said, I just need my sling and God. And God's the one that guided my sing. And if God could take down a giant that as a ruddy teenager I had no business being in the same field with, who do I have to fear? Who do I have to be afraid of? Now, obviously, as New Testament Christians, we are going to make application of salvation as far as salvation. Knowing Jesus Christ, your personal Savior. I love being saved. Amen. It really does eliminate a lot of fears. I don't fear death. Now, I'm not excited for it. I'm not pushing it. I'm 29. <laughs> I'm hoping to see some great grandkids one day, maybe even some great greats, depending on how my kids are going to have to get. I, actually, I don't want my, I don't necessarily want great great grandkids because that may mean some 16 year olds getting pregnant somewhere down the line. If they're married, I mean, whatever. But anyways, uh, I plan on a long life, but I'm not afraid of death. Many fear death. For many, that's a scary thing to think of sickness and ailments. And, and by the way, I'm not saying I wouldn't be. Afraid if I if, if I was diagnosed with cancer if I was I, I'm not saying there wouldn't be any fear in my heart But I don't have to fear death I'd be more afraid of how is this all gonna like kind of play out because I, I wouldn't want to just wither away You know, I always said I used to say I wanted to die when I was 60 now, you know, I'm an idiot Because <laughs> when you're about a teenager you think 60 is old man. That's up there. My dad's you know 35 40 you know, and so you think 60s is just ancient. You say, I'm just going to drive a dirt bike off of like ramp when I'm 60. Just go out in a blaze of glory. I'm not afraid of death. I don't have to fear Satan either, though. I don't have to fear him. Now, granted, can he get his licks in on me? Yes, if I let him. But that's only if I let him. It's only like if I open the door and say, all right, come on in, ransack the place. I don't have to worry about it. God has freed me from sin. He's freed me from the power of Satan. I don't have to worry about those things because I have the salvation of God. Amen. Is there a time in your life where you accepted the salvation of the Lord? Amen. Do you know of a time in your life, a specific moment? I'm not saying you've got to remember the date. Now, I remember the time and date because I got saved. I thought I got saved when I was seven. I grew up in church, lived in church. I mean, not lived in church. Praise the Lord. My pastor wouldn't have liked me as much if I lived in church. I grew up in church and I was in church all of my, my, my life. It has been all my life. And so I knew when I got saved, I, I knew I'm going to write this down. I want to remember it. So I know the date and time personally. But I'm not even saying, do you remember the date and the time? I'm saying, do you remember the moment? I may forget my anniversary every now and then, but I don't forget when it happened. I don't forget seeing Holly walk down. I don't, I don't forget saying I do. I don't forget putting the rings on each other's fingers. I don't forget being cold because it was December and we had an outdoor wedding. <laughs> I don't forget those things. Have you ever trusted Jesus Christ your personal Savior? I'm not saying you got to have a date, but do you remember the moment where you acknowledged that you were a sinner, acknowledged that you needed a Savior and that Jesus Christ was that Savior? He really did live a perfect and sinless life, die on the cross for your sin. Not everyone's sin. He did for everyone's sin, but specifically your sin, raised from the dead, and that all you had to do was call upon Him. Do you remember that day? Amen. If you don't, today can be that day. The Lord gave him victory over wicked men. The Lord caused many in the past to fall when they came up to defeat David. That was one thing that David loved. He said, man, I, I want to be in the house of the Lord because I, I think of all the victories you gave me, God. I love thinking of past victories. I love thinking of past victories. I think of myself as a teenager and man, to, see a, to know I'm a pastor now, if you just saw me when I was about 15, 16, you'd have been like, 
No, no, not, not possible. Now, I didn't live some crazy wicked life, but I saw the victories. I saw overcoming sin. I saw overcoming problems. I saw overcoming selfishness and desires. I also wonder sometimes, how many things did God protect me from just because I was a child of God? Like things that could have happened, maybe even should have happened, but because I was a child of God, God just spared me and I don't even know about it. Say, I don't think that happens. I don't know. It happens all the time with my own family. There's times I save my kids from things they don't even realize. You know, they're running through the house and you just move something knowing, man, they're going to, they would have creamed that barn door. They, I move this and you say, or, or you just catch them when they're falling and they just jump up and go play. And you're thinking if I had not caught their head where it would have ended, I, I got to believe my God's doing that for me. The, the victories, the past victories, the, the victory over wicked men. But the Lord also gives confidence, confidence. Charles Spurgeon said, and now this is a quote from Charles Spurgeon, so his, you know, he's got more of an older English. Bear with me. I don't even know some of these words, to be honest, and I didn't look them up. <laughs> Doubtless the shadow of anticipated trouble is to, uh, timorous, is to timorous minds a more prolific source of sorrow than the trouble itself. But faith puts a strengthening plaster to the back of courage and throws out the window of the dregs of the cup of trembling. Now, I don't understand all of it, but I get what he's trying to say. Here's kind of what he's trying to say in simple terms. Sometimes just anticipating trouble causes us more sorrow than the trouble itself. Yeah. Yeah. That's what he's really saying. Sometimes just thinking of what, oh my goodness, what it could, we've just talked before service. I don't worry about whatever's coming with my back. I'm not worried about it because until why stress about something I don't know about. David could face even the prospect of war confidently because God had protected him in the past. He said, oh, I could sit here and sweat about who's going to come up to me next. What armies are going to, which one of my sons is going to betray me next? Which one of my sons is going to try to do something crazy to me next? Which one of my sons is going to try to hurt one of my daughters next? What problems are going to come? But he says, man, I can face war. I can face difficulty. I can face problems with confidence because of the Lord. What God had done in the past made David confident in God and want to dwell in his presence for the rest of his life. And that confidence led David to pray the prayer of verses 7 through 14. Now, we won't take a long time to break this down. It's a wonderful prayer, but it's not the focal point of the message, I don't think. So let's just cover it real quick. Verse 7, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. David always, always, always asks for mercy, which is don't, don't give me what I do deserve. Grace is unmerited favor where you say, if I hand Nathan $100, that's grace. He didn't deserve that. He definitely don't deserve $100. But I'm giving it to him. That's grace. Mercy is Nathan owing me $100 and me saying, don't worry about it. You, you, you should pay me, but I'm not worried about it. Mercy. David said, give me mercy. By the way, that's one of the things that made David so special is because no matter what bad thing happened in his life, he was willing to say, it's my fault. When he's thinking of Absalom sleeping with the concubines, taking over his kingdom, you know what he, did? You know what he was thinking? God! Or he wasn't thinking this. God, why did you let this happen? He was thinking, if I'd have been a better father, if I'd never sinned with Bathsheba, if I'd never done the things that I did, this probably wouldn't be happening. God, have mercy on me. Mercy. Uh, verse 8. When thou saidest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. He said, I've been seeking your face. When you said it, I did it. Verse 9. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. He said, you've always been my help. Don't leave me now. By the way, I don't think he believed God was going to leave him. I think he was just encouraging God. I, I like your help. You just stick around. You just, you just, I, I just want to hang out with you. Verse 10, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. We already covered that. Basically, even when, even when my own parents couldn't help me, God, you're, you're going to help me. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Uh, there's a right way to respond to problems and, and, and enemies. He's saying, show me the right way. Because David had a, lot of, he had a lot of avenues. Army come up against him, I can send out of army. That's an option. Or, God, if you want, I can send out some, you know, negotiators. We can handle this without any blood. And if that's the way you want me to do it, that's the way I want to do it. But if you want me to wipe them out totally, just tell me, Lord, and I'll give me the right path. We're almost done here. Verse 12, deliver me not over 
unto the will of mine enemies. For false witnesses are risen up against me, and such, and such as breathe out cruelty. Basically saying, Lord, don't let what they say about me ruin everything that I've got going on. That's deliver me into the will of mine enemies. What they're trying to say I am, don't, don't, make that, don't let that come to pass. I had fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So I would have passed out. <laughs> I had fainted unless I believed to see. I would have given up if I hadn't seen the goodness of Jesus Christ in my life, in this life. He said I would have given up. The problems I faced, there's many Christians that can attest to that. say, man, I would have just given up if I wasn't saved. And then his encouragement once again, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen thy heart. He said, you just let the Lord handle it. You just go to the Lord with your problems and, and be of good courage. By the way, when it's God handling it, you can be pretty confident that it's going to get handled right. It's one thing I do love about when God handles something. It always seems to work out well. When I handle it, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes my wife is upset when I handle things. <laughs> and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. The point of this psalm is simple. David saw the house of God as a safe place because of what God had done for him in the past. David had saw the house of God as a safe place because of what God had done for him in the past. If you don't desire to be in the house of God, it's because you have forgotten what God has done for you. Well, like what? I don't know. God saved your soul if you're saved. Amen. God protected and provided for you. If you make $32,000 a year, you're in the top 1% of the world financially. So well, I'm not quite a 32. <laughs> You're still in pretty high percent there. He's protected and provided for you. If you're this old, that means he's protected you this long. Amen. God loved you. That's amazing in itself. I literally could talk about that for probably an hour. God loved you. He loved me. I'm not worth loving. I don't know how I tricked Holly, but I'm not worth loving. What makes the house of God so special? Well, the house of God is special because it's a safe place. It's a place of victory. It's a place to give joyfully. It's a place of stability. It's a place to give praise to God. It's a wonderful place. I think tonight God wants us to dwell on those things like David. And if we dwell on those things like David did, like David, we will desire to be in the presence of God daily. Yes, we can say specifically we can desire to be at church every time the doors are open. But if we're dwelling on what God has done for us in the past and the goodness of God, we'll want to dwell in his presence daily, even in our personal Bible reading and prayer time. Because, man, how could you not want to spend time with the one that does so much for you? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this time in your word, this time in your house. I ask that you would uh, continue to bless. Lord, help us to take this sermon to heart. If there's a reason why we don't desire to be in the presence of God, if we don't desire to be in the house of God, if, 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 if there is that in our hearts, it most likely is because we've forgotten what you've done for us in the past, and we've forgotten about the amazing things that happen in your presence and in your house. Help us with that, Lord. If there's anyone that doesn't know you as their personal Savior today, Lord, I ask that you'd continue to water that seed and that one day we'd see the increase. We could rejoice with you in it. Keep us safe as we dismiss from this place. Bring us back together at the next point in time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you.